Lord, thank you that you are high and lifted up. Your countenance is holy. And thank you that men and women of many faiths and over many, many years have called you Lord. And we have the record of their testimony, and it brings joy to our heart. Oh, God, we want to know the record of those who were faithful so we can see what does faithfulness look like? How can we have a high view of you? And won't you be with us in our time tonight and tomorrow in Christ? Amen. Okay, so this is my title. Why is it a vanishing paradigm? But first, Francis asked, so I had to paste this in. Go ahead, Jim. Ask that I have, look. <laughs> Those are my grandsons. <laughs> Aren't they so darling? So I have a great Presbyterian story about the one on the right, the, the redhead who's five, Everett. No, go back to the boys. They don't care about text, really. <laughs> okay, so he has just learned the Apostles' Creed. Uh, he's five. His, my daughter, oldest daughter, these are her boys. So these are my only grandchildren, though Tex and I share eight. And um, she is Anglican, and she is taking the creed seriously. And that's a high view, too. I, maybe I'll have time to go into that tomorrow. But anyway, so he has a very strong lisp. So about a month ago, he says, Nana, we got to Skype today. It's very important. Very important. I said, okay, let's Skype. So he gets on the Skype, and he goes, stand back, Nana. I'm like, oh. I'm from the Skype. I'm like, okay, I'm going to stand right back here. And he's on the screen from Iowa. And he says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, the only son I would. Who was going to see about all the God's born and born Mary? I'm like, Everett, slow, slow down and go back. And he goes, Nana, if you interrupt me, I have to start at the very beginning every time. <laughs> so she's doing something right. He has no idea what he's saying. Maybe it's the copying Nana in the fast talking, but that's pretty great. Okay, go ahead. And here's my sweetie Tex. He's so wonderful. Go ahead. Who's in for his first love is this dog. <laughs> so he has eight grandchildren, but this is what's in his phone. And he just retired from 45 years in banking. And he had these screens in his office, big screens. Some of you who know technical stuff, which I have zero ability at that as well. He would drag numbers across these screens for 45 years, these giant, right? But on every screen, when it went to blank, would be Dave. Dave Brown, our dog, Dave. <laughs> when I come home from speaking trips, there they are. You mesh together on the couch or on the floor. Okay, go ahead. You just had to see my family. This is somebody that's very close to me tonight. So a week ago tonight, this is my best friend from 25 years in Connecticut. And she went to be with the Lord last Friday, ladies. After a long and valiantly fought battle with cancer and you'll hear more about her tomorrow because she is the person who influenced me the most for Christ in my 20 years and 25 years in Connecticut and um, just think all those all those questions um, are over John Calvin said this which is on your sheets I believe the sovereignty of God answers every question memorize it know it it's fabulous and this is somebody who died with such grace and joy and without any complaining and we asked the Lord five years ago to prolong her life so that she could raise her boys because she was my age, but had babies. My baby's 28. So her boys are 15 and 16. And the Lord gave her five years that are miraculous. There's no explanation for having a five-year remission when you have breast cancer in your lungs and liver growing, your shoulder and your coccyx. And she had five years her agnostic cancer doctor, whom I've known for 25 years, will be at this service Thursday night that I'm flying to from Orlando to speak. And he said to Jenny, there is no medical explanation for this remission. And she said that's because it was spiritually given. So I wish you would pray for that. But she will be an example I will use in this talk. But thanks for your leadership team just carried me through this last week. The day before she died, which was completely unexpected, my only brother, my only sibling, who was a missionary for years, had a massive heart attack. So last week, but he's fine. It was a really big week. Let's go forward, Jen, but they can think about Jenny. So I want to talk about tonight. I want to set the stage for what we're going to do uh, the next couple of days to talk about why this high view of God is missing in the modern church. I'm sure it's not missing at Redeemer. It's not missing at Redeemer in NYC either, where I got to get to go every time I go back to NYU, my alma mater. <clears throat> and it's not missing in many Orthodox circles, but it's largely missing in the Western church. 
And this is because today we think the gospel is all about us. When I was a speaker for Focus on the Family for 10 years, about halfway through my tenure, I was given a huge conference in Dallas, and I went to a room much bigger than this to get ready, and I saw that they had the cross up, oh, just like this. But across the cross was a banner. They were preparing for the weekend, and I was meant to be the speaker, and across the banner it said, it's all about you, meaning us, that the, it's, it's all about us. The gospel is all about us. This, this is so commonly taught today that some places where I go, people, there's not even a murmur like there is here. People are just like, what, what's your point? Of course it's about us. So I got up on the stage in front of the 700 women, and I said, I have good news and bad news. Um, the bad news is I'm not the right speaker for this conference. And the good news is, the good news is it's not all about us. Praise God that the gospel is about the glory of Christ. John 17, that last night of his life, 13 times in the Greek in that one chapter, he says to the Lord, glorify you. Everything I've done, I've come to glorify you. I'm returning to glorify you. I'm giving you the body to glorify you. I've finished the work you gave me, and that's going to glorify you. And their mutual um, love and complete unity and sufficiency, which is a big word we're missing today. We'll talk about that tomorrow as well was enough. We weren't created because the Godhead was lonely. And so the idea that the overflow of their perfect love, it, that it deigns to fall on us, we should never get over it. But the man that I recommend the most, which is why we have about 25 copies of this, yours is a different color, gray and white, but this little book, The Knowledge of the Holy, really changed me. When I was just starting my doctoral work, I was able to make a four-year program into six and a half years. It was awesome. <laughs> but part of it is that I kept being waylaid by great dead guys that I love. And this is my, one of my most recently great dead guys. A.W. Tozer died the same day as C.S. Lewis and Jack Kennedy. <clears throat> the Lord lost unusual difference of leaders on that day, and he was a prophet. And he said in the middle of the 20th century, if this trend continues... By the 21st century, the gospel will be stated in terms of being mainly about us and that the glory of the Godhead will recede. Let me give you a quote by him that we're going to use anyway. Oh, no, I'm only going forward. You have to go forward, Jim, to the one that says the essence of idolatry. It's like five in. This is why I like to have my clicker, but he's on it, man. Look at this. The essence of idolatry is to think thoughts about God. Where are my glasses? Are they over there? This is normal. That's why they call them absent-minded professors. And everywhere I go, I leave a litter of trail of papers. After I leave here, there'll be clothing in the room and everything. Okay. So let me just read. Look at this. and Just let this sink in. The essence of idolatry is to think thoughts about God that are low thoughts instead of high thoughts. The history of mankind will show that no people has ever risen above its religion, and man's spiritual history will demonstrate that no religion is higher than its idea of God. Worship is high or low as, an as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts about God. So your worship is as high as your view of God. John Stott, love this. I did a whole conference on this for mops. You can never give your kids a higher view of God than you hold. Moms, this is the most important thing you can do, is to raise your view of God. It's more important than love Jesus and lose 12 pounds in six weeks and all the things, all the tags and slogans of our modern age. The reason I love the great dead guys is because their focus almost exclusively was on the character of God. And I'm going to prove that to you in our four sessions together. And my favorite great dead guy after dad is Jonathan Edwards. And that's, I'm going to devote the whole session Sunday morning to, to Dr. Edwards, and pretty, pretty awesome. And he's from Connecticut, too. Okay. So, yep. You forgot. Take pictures of this. you got to have it. Look at this middle one. Jonathan Edwards had a mentor. This is something else we're going to find out about great dead guys. They always had a mentor drawing them up into a high view. And his mentor was a guy named Henry Skuggle. Right now I'm writing a little course on um, and we, we need to find a way to give the ladies the PowerPoint. We can do that, right? Because there are going to be so many quotes. There are going to be too many for you to take one frame at a time. But anyway, we will do that, all right? So Henry Skogel died at 28 of TB um, in Scotland, about 1600. He was a little-known vicar 
in a Scottish church. My son went to the University of Scotland uh, to be a linguist and had the privilege of taking me not just to John Knox's home, but to the parish where Henry Skuggle lived. Before he died, he said to his mother, one parish, one brief life, could it have mattered at all for the kingdom? He wrote one, one book, and the book was called The Life of God and the Soul of Man. And a hundred years later, a shy, introverted, um, New England farm slash pastor's son, the middle son of ten daughters, hello, found this book, The Life of God and the Soul of Man. And in that book is this quote, the worth and excellency of a soul is measured by the object of its affection. Isn't that precious? This is the problem with the modern age. We're worshiping BMWs and bigger jobs and vacations, and you can fill in the blank of idolatry. It can be the perfect marriage. It can be the perfect family. It can be the perfect ministry. But we need to have the worth and character of Christ as our object of affection. The worth and the reason my friend Jenny wasn't troubled by the advance of cancer is because it was bringing her closer to her Savior every day. And she said, I seem to find... Al, when you talk about the great dead guys, that they seem to reinforce that it's the use of suffering that is God's primary tool for shaping us into his image. So if I can look more like Jesus, I want to submit to that gladly. Edward said that this quote revolutionized his thinking, and he's the father of the great awakening. So don't you love that quote? All right, now Jim will try to go back in order. That's hard for me, very hard. Let's do the dilemma we face. This is very good. Left to ourselves, we tend immediately, this is also Tozer, to reduce God to manageable terms. We want to get him where we can use him. We at least want to know where he is when we need him. We want a God that we can in some measure control. If all this sounds strange to our modern ears, to have the glory of God be highest, it's only because for a full half century we have taken God for granted. The glory of God has not been revealed to this generation of men. A lot of these gems are in this book, The Knowledge of the Holy. Tomorrow we're going to sell a bunch of books that I referenced from the great dead. Guys, you have a bibliography which, which starts with great classics you should have read. You should start there. And we have many other for sale at discount for you. Isn't that good? So let, we'll go back to him. Other guys or Craig, whoever's running it. We hopefully we'll touch on all these great dead guys this weekend, but this high view was one that all the great dead guys shared after day. That's not a great dead guy as much as I sometimes might wish that. Okay. Said a lot, all of these guys that we'll, I'll introduce to you. Augustine, the book I had to write for Gordon Conwell was a comparison between Augustine and 1,400 years later, Jonathan Edwards. And they both had this high view of God and the church was flourishing. And today, here's, here's what I found in short. Either in the church, in history, God is primary and central and man is low. God is high and man is low. Or, as is the current state, man is high and prominent and God is low. They cannot both be high. And so I posit that Augustine and Edward shared this high view. And it was a time of great vitality in the church. 400 A.D., 1700 A.D. And today we don't have that view. And you recognize many of these names. I'll come back to them. Next slide. Here's a little verse you might not know. You thought, said the Lord to the wicked man, you thought I was altogether like you. God is not every good quality we have, but better. That, the, the word holy, which is his char chief characteristic, C.S. Lewis says that the holiness of God is at the center of God's character in the same way as if, imagine up here that we had a bunch of different balls. Let's say we have every ball that Francis can master. We have basketballs and footballs and soccer balls and Nerf balls and beach balls and every single kind of ball. They can be small or large. They can be marble or Nerf, right? But what's the one thing they all have to be to be a ball? Round or spherical. So Lewis said that the holiness of God is the roundness of his character. Isn't that powerful because holiness equals other and that's what it means in the hebrew separate how are we how are we supposed to pray to him we're supposed to pray our father who art in heaven holy hallowed separate be your name you're other you're you're not like us 
And here God is saying in the Psalms, your sin comes from the fact that you think I'm like you. And we live in an age where God is described as our giant buddy and pal. He's like a giant rabbit's foot that we can rub when we really need something. And we're talking to the ceiling, ladies, because our God is holy. He's other. And that's why we have to... This is what's on your bookmark I found this afternoon. Our, his thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. How different are his thoughts? Oh, yeah, they're as high and different from our thoughts as the heavens are from the earth. We need to believe in the difference of his character, his holiness. Now, you say, well, how can I... How, what would be a measure of being able to think high thoughts about God? What would that look like? And you'll have time to think about that in your small groups. But in church history, great dead guys said many, but my favorite ones especially, Tozer, Edwards, um, Calvin, said that what you think of when your mind is at rest tells the most about you. When we were on this highway for three days this afternoon, we should have packed a lunch to get from here to our... Um, when you're in traffic alone, when you're at a stoplight, when you're at your kid's soccer game and they're not on the field, when you're in a waiting room, right? When you're thought, aren't you like me? And you're scrolling through the next 17 things you have to do this week. You might be like me. I'm thinking about my adult children and the good and bad choices they might be making. I'm thinking about my grandchildren. When your mind is at rest, our thoughts are most often about ourselves. The measure of godliness is that as you age in Christ, your thoughts are more and more about the Lord. And this is how Jenny was in all the last months of her life. She would just look off and then say, have you ever heard this verse? Allie, have you ever heard this verse in Isaiah? Have you ever heard this verse? Did you know this verse? And my father is a great, great example of this. He had Parkinson's. It was a very difficult, it protracted death for him. And he had a helper named Melvin, who was a charismatic assembly of God. Bishop, you know, that's what he said. Bishop, he had a t-shirt that said Melvin the Bishop, so you would not forget. And he was about the size of Francis' son, Will. That's how big he was. Strapping guy. And he had a bald black head. You know, he looked like a black Kojak. And he had a smile that was so beautiful. He loved my dad. And the two of them, this Mutt and Jeff act, would go out every afternoon for a walk with dad's walker in their country club in Charlotte. So there were 26 drains, drainage, you know, drains in the loop that they would make before daddy got worse. So here's what my dad said to Melvin. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go by every drain, and every drain represents a letter of the alphabet. And when we get to the drain, the first person you can say a verse that starts with that letter wins. And you would see this Mutt and Jeff act with dad shuffling and Melvin striding along, and they'd get to a drain and it'd say, C, you know. Cry out to God. Nations of the earth cry out to God with songs of wonder. And they'd have to give the reference. It's a wonderful thing to do with your children. And pick a letter. E, except, you know, E, um, except you come into the kingdom like a child, you will never be born again. And they would go and talk about, because my dad's great joy in his last years was to think about the Lord. So developing high thinking of God will help us with cancer and unemployment and unruly children and it will help us age in the way we want to age, all right? Here's the issue of our present age. Go forward to stop, please. I think we've done the others. Here's what we've done in the present age, and this is Tozer as well. <clears throat> we have minimized, to minimize the fear of God, which we need to redeem that word, we have exchanged his transcendence for his imminence. I am M, Emmanuel, God with us, his horizontal presence with us. We've exchanged his transcendent glory for the fact that he's near to us. And the, the bargain has been very low for us. We've given away those great and awesome things about him that inspire our obedience. One reason is because fearing God is very out of vogue today. People say, oh, no, no, remember perfect love casts out fear. Well, there are two Greek words for fear, and one of them is used hundreds of times in the Bible, and one is used very seldom. And fearing God in Scripture is meant to be the root emotion that leads to obedience, and then obedience over time if it's like a tree, because we fear him, which means reverence and awe, respect, the way we used to talk about our parents, the way I had to think about my parents, I'm sure Francis did too. Fearing God led to obedience, and then obedient, obeying them leads to love. John 14, 23. Who is the one who really knows me? The one who obeys me. 
And as they obey me, I will reveal myself to them. So more obedience leads to more love. But the root is fear. I'll give you a challenge. I'm teaching a course at my church right now on fearing God. There's a wonderful book on this by Jerry Bridges, the navigator, who just went to be with the Lord. It's called Fearing God. Highly recommend it, especially for a book written so recently. And in it, he says that to do a study and that there are more promises attendant in the Bible for fearing God than for obeying him or loving him together. And I have found in my two years of study of this book that that's true. That the greatest promises in the Bible have to do with fearing him. One place you could look is in Deuteronomy 5, which is the account of the Ten Commandments. It's the same uh, correlative account as Exodus 20, but we have a little more color in Deuteronomy. And at the end of the giving of the Ten Commandments, he says, he says to Moses, come up here. And the people say to Moses, don't come out and tell us what God said. We're afraid. We're afraid. And then, and then God says to Moses, oh, that they would fear me and obey me, and it would go well for them and for their children. And then he says, yes, Moses, you come up and send the people down. Everything they've said is true. So the people are withdrawing, and God looks down on the scene, and he looks at their hearts, and he says, yes, indeed, you go back. And Moses, whose heart is pure, you come up. It's a great study. He says, oh, that they would fear me because then they would obey me. Parents, this is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to produce fear of parents in, rev in a reverent, awesome way in our kids. And then the fear and reverence they have for us is what they transfer to the living God when they're no longer under our umbrella. And that happened for me. And my father grew up in a terrible home. You would not even believe the testimony. When they say truth is stranger than fiction, I think my daddy's picture was that quote. So his sister's been married seven times, his brother eight. My mother uh, and dad were married 60 years before he passed. And um, he had no father. The father he had left when he was eight. He and his brother and sister lived in a trailer outside of Detroit. And they would wake up on Sunday mornings and they had two pairs of shoes, everyday shoes and good shoes. But his sister had a baby when she was 15, so she wouldn't take him to church. His brother was never there. His mother had to work nights. So when he was 13, my dad got up and put on the good shoes and walked down to the Methodist church in the snow, the closest church. For five years, my dad walked to that church. And the year he turned 18, he got the youth award and they gave him a $500 scholarship, which was a fortune in the 50s, to go to Michigan State, his alma mater. And as they gave him the scholarship for outstanding youth, they said, we wanna meet your family. Where's your family? He said, yeah, my family can't come with me. And then he said, could I just ask you one thing today? I was just wondering if someone would pray with me to receive Christ. For five years, he went to that church. I mean, the hand of God on my dad's life was so great calling him in. So he had zero model of parenting. And then they're given my brother and me. My brother spent 12 years in Kenya, still involved in ministry. I've been in ministry all my 35 years of teaching. Christian work, and they did that by giving us such a high view of God that when I lived in Israel for almost a year and then did graduate work overseas as well, went to the mission field for part of the time, I, everywhere I went around the world, I'd love to tell you that it was the awareness of God watching me. No, it was the awareness of dad. I did not want to disappoint my dad. So my fear and reverence for him enabled me to live an obedient single life. That's how it's supposed to work. But when present parents put the affection and friendship of their kids ahead of teaching them to fear and reverence them, do you see the fallout? All these quotes seem very arcane until we realize how relevant they are. Here's another one, two, two slides later, Jim. When we lose sight of the majesty of God, comma, two more. No. Nope. You're way at the end now. Definitely not at the end. So go back to when we lose sight. It's the one after the essence of idolatry. I missed my clicker. There we go. When we lose sight of the majesty of God, we invariably fill in the blank in our vision with the fable of some other kind of majesty. We revere a spouse or a leader 
or we give deference to ourselves, and this is folly. This is Tim Keller. Life is too short and too precious to spend fearing the wrong things in the wrong ways. Isn't there a verse in Isaiah, yeah, in Isaiah that says, let him be your fear, let him be your dread. I'll give you that reference tomorrow, but I know it's Isaiah. Okay, next slide. Here's a great dead guy story that goes with this. The story of John Donne. Do you all know about John Donne? He's amazing. He was a vicar in 1600, and he lived during the bubonic plague. Maybe you know that two-thirds of Europe's population died during this plague. Think of that for a minute. The present environs of London were set because they had to continue out into the farmland in order to find enough space to bury the quarter of a million people that died in a 10-year stretch in England. So they pushed out, 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 burying people, out, out, out. So John Dunn was a vicar in London at that time. He buried four children and then his wife. He preached her funeral service from this text in Lamentations, I am the man who hath seen affliction. Then he got the plague. In those days, what they did for the plague was to cover them with leeches. And he lay there, and he is the one who wrote the famous poem, For Whom the Bell Tolls. But do you know what that poem means? Only you history buffs know. So every time they buried a soul in London, they rang the bell. And it was said that there was a period of seven weeks during which the bell rang day and night. Dong, 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 dong. So he is laying there on his bed covered with leeches. His wife is gone. And he's hearing the bell. Ask not for whom the bell tolls. It, it tolls for you. Jenny recently said to me, Allie, in the scheme of life, if I get 20 more years, it's a puff. It's a puff. What is our life? It is a vapor, James says. So for God to take me is his pleasure and decision. So he lay there and he said, ask not for whom the bell tolls. And he said, as I lay there, I had this moment of clarity where I realized that I could fear God or everything else. Isn't that good? So ladies, this is also an antidote for anxiety. Fearing God keeps you from fearing everything else. And Jenny is my testimony for that. Because her confidence in God was so strong and steady that she never doubted his loving kindness for her in spite of this difficult last 15 years. 15 years. Oswald Chambers says that we fear circumstances so much because we fear God so little. We're like hostage to every new thing that happens. <gasps> what about this? <gasps> what about this? No, God has it all. Tomorrow morning we'll look at some of my favorite sovereignty verses. And in fact, I want you to look up your homework. You'll see it there on your sheet. Look up these verses at the bottom of the sheet so that you can be ready for our time tomorrow. I want you to look up and see. So three A's to remember. One more, please. Three A's to remember that you can memorize. I try to have a mnemonic outline. Tonight is high view. Tomorrow morning is heart at ease, which is what sovereignty and reverence for God produces. And then tomorrow afternoon, holy habits. What are the disciplines of the ancient church that we no longer practice that reflect a high view of God? There are several. <laughs> there are several. So um, with our mnemonic outline, we want to have awe, approach, and authority. So the first part of a high view is have awe and reverence for God. And we direct you to Isaiah 6, along with these passages. When you look them up tonight or in the morning before you come, the more time you spend here, the more you'll get out of the talk. And Isaiah 40, you know very well about the majesty of our God. It's the one that begins with Handel's, remember, part. He carries the young like a lamb in, their, in his arms, and it ends with those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. It's probably, I don't know, Luther said it was the most majestic chapter of the Bible. He's also the one who said that Romans was the greatest letter ever written. I spent five years in Romans with my ladies' Bible class, which looks a lot like this group. And it was a privilege, and it was an uphill climb the whole way. So take these and see if you can see verses that reflect the awe that we should have of our God. And I would add Isaiah 6, too, for your own study. And you know Isaiah 6 is about his call. And it says that the call of God and the vision of God was so amazing that the train of his robe filled the temple. The train of his robe. So if you're called into a church, 
let's take my little daughter Anna. She's the size of my left leg, as my mother loves to say. Anyway, she's five foot tall and weighs about 90 pounds. And she wanted a classic New England wedding because she's a Yankee girl. And we had it in a church in a field in Connecticut that was so gorgeous with a black and white big marble floor. If there's any Yankees here, I know Shauna. That's so great. And the windows that go the whole length, um, you look out the nave into the fields in stonework, and the nave and the transept and the choir in a loft in the back. And Anna had a tiny little person with a long, long dress, and this is what she wanted since she was little, this dress. She said, I want to be in the dress and have the train at the door. And the, everybody was like, is she pulling the dress or is the dress pulling her? Because it was touch and go. Was she going to make it down the aisle? She's a little tiny thing and pulling this long train. Imagine someone coming to see the wedding and saying, all I saw was the train. There was nothing else. The vision of God that Isaiah had was so great that it says that the train of his robe filled the temple. But at the sight of that, it's kind of like Moses who never got to see the face of God, when Moses said in Exodus 33, show me your glory, the Lord said, I, I can't show you my glory, you'll die. And yet it says that Moses was a friend of God. In Numbers 12, it says that Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. And God said, I cannot show you my glory, it will burn you up. So instead, Isaiah and Moses saw the shadow of the reflecting of the passing of the Right in, Mo in Moses' case, and Isaiah saw the train of his robe, and it filled the temple. And the sight of the train of his robe was so great that the inanimate objects in the building shook. So the inanimate things of nature know to quake in the presence of God. But the people of God come in for communion with baseball hats on. I'm sure not here. But the whole present reverence for God is so low. We have people on their phones in church. We have people making tennis dates while they're passing uh, the communion plate, which is the body and blood of our Lord. As a focus on the family speaker, I was introduced to a very wide variety of worship, which made me only more glad that I was Presbyterian followed by Anglican. I literally said that I would never go back to the Southern Baptist Church, which, of course, the way, the way that God is, that's where I am now. Bringing high view thinking and Presbyterian theology with me every step of the way. But the point is, they flew me to California for a conference and in the emergent church, in a warehouse church, one of three where the pastor has recently said he will no longer teach the doctrine of sin as being a downer. People don't want to hear about their sin. Ladies, if you don't have a sin problem, you don't need a savior. The high view of God begins with the low view of man. This is what I deserve, and yet this is what I received. How can that be? And at this um, warehouse church, and of course they are not all like this at all, but this one was vast, and I didn't see anyone in leadership over 18. And as I finished my talk, one of the teenagers came to the front in a, in a hat, a baseball cap, and said um, into the mic, hey, we're going to have communion, which is what we have every six weeks, and the baskets are at the door, and help yourselves on the way out. It was buffet style. And literally, I lunged for the mic. Like the old lady in the place. I'm like, ah! I lunged for them. I'm like, I, Dr. L, will be right at the back door. <laughs> I will be praying with anyone that wants to pray. And I said to this guy, Jared, I said, where are the deacons? Who are the people that monitor? He says, no, it's self-serve. Ladies, we wonder why the modern church is so anemic. We have substituted the glory and majesty. Corinthians says that the church at Corinth was sick and some were dying because of their abuse of the Lord's table. But all this comes from a low view of God, from a casual view, and that communion too is casual and it's not. So approach is how we come to him. How do we respond? How do we respond to his character? How do we respond to events in our life? And then authority is a root issue. We don't have time to go into that tonight. I'm sure it will come up some tomorrow, but you, you have to have the right view of authority to fear, to fear them. I knew that my daddy was not primarily my buddy when I wrote to ask him or tell him that I'd used up all my money in Israel and I still had three weeks to go. Like, I, there's, I have no money. Okay, so there's a little problem and I brought too many books, etc. So 
You have to have the right view of authority to have the reverent view of who, who our God is. And I would love to tell you that there are many modern people that have this view, but I can only think of a few, like Dr. Keller and Piper and Alistair Begg, of course, David Jeremiah. I mean, there are many, but there are not many in the church at large. And the writing in the modern church is changing. And as a church <clears throat> historian, to immerse myself in all these guys and all the great dead guys you'll find back there, I think I'll be able to make my case for you tomorrow. But one um, easy way to do it is this prayer I want to show you. Tomorrow I'll talk a little bit about Susanna Wesley. She's one of my hero heroines. She raised 17 children. Her husband left her in the middle of the children for three and a half years because she did not say amen to his prayer and left her with the manse and the children and the care of the, uh, really the whole parish where he was the vicar. But the point is that she instilled such a high view of God that her two sons together launched the largest Protestant denomination in the world today. The Methodist Church is still larger than any other denomination worldwide, as you know that. And these were two tiny men, unprepossessing, not exceptionally uh, intellectually gifted, but oh, the passion she poured in them. Look at the kind of prayer. This is a book that's out of print. I only brought one with me. I only had one to give. And it's a book of the prayers of the Wesleys, Susanna, John, and Charles. Look at this one as an example of high view. Almighty God, help us to speak worthily of you, of your magnificence and your nature. You are the high and holy one who inhabits eternity. You are immense, the infinitely perfect mind. You are absolutely pure and separated from all iniquity. There is no shadow of turning in you. Oh, God, help us to approach you with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Many of her children went on to be incredible leaders for the kingdom. And this book is full of prayers just like this. There are many prayer books that I use to help me with a high view, and none of them are modern. <laughs> I'd love to tell you. My favorite one, well, my favorite one is probably Valley of Vision, which you can get for $9 off of CBD or Amazon. Um, I recommend going ahead and just getting the leather copy because I wore through three papers, and now I have a leather, and only Tex knows where it is because if I take it out of the house, I will lose it. But after that, my second favorite is this little book called A Diary of Private Prayer. And all of these books should be on your, on your book list. It's an Anglican book. And I want to close our time tonight by reading this, my favorite prayer of this. And I encourage you, if you have modern people to read that are producing the same kind of high view, then read them. The main thing you should be reading is this. Because this is where the character of God is most clearly revealed. Um, Isaiah is a great book for high view, and then also Romans, especially. I'm teaching Hebrews right now for two years, and that's a powerful book whose theme is Christ is better. Um, so I recommend it to you. So please spend a little time looking at those verses, and we're going to dive right in to Calvin's favorite quote, that the sovereignty of God answers every question in the morning. Will you pray this in your heart with me as I pray it? Just Say these things in your heart to the Lord, just as if I were um, praying from my mind instead of a written, prepared, awesome text. Lord God, we say to you tonight, Eternal Father, that we know we are but a vapor. We remember that we are strangers and pilgrims on this earth. Here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Preserve us by your grace, good Lord, from so losing ourselves in the joys of earth that we have no longing left for the joys of heaven. Let never the happiness or security of this present day become a snare to our two worldly hearts. And if today, instead of happiness, we have suffered a disappointment or defeat, if there has been sorrow where we hoped for joy, if there has been sickness when we ask for health, give us grace to accept all from your hand as a loving reminder that this world is not our home. We thank thee, O Lord, that you have so set eternity within our hearts that no earthly thing will ever satisfy us wholly. No person, no relationship, no calling. Thank you that every present joy is mixed with just this amount of sadness and unrest to call us up, up, to lead our minds up to the contemplation of your greatness. 
And above all, God, we thank you tonight for the sure hope and promise of an endless life and that the light and momentary affliction we face works for us an exceeding eternal weight of glory. We commend ourselves to you tonight and we ask by your grace that we might be privileged to see tomorrow. In Christ we pray. Amen.